Finally, I want to thank Don Lineback for bringing our speaker to us today. And Don is going to introduce us to him. So take it away, Don. Thank you, Nancy. Good morning. Uh, I am the uh, former Don Lineback. I'm now a Furman retiree and Ollie member. And I am Nancy's number one fan, as she should know. Uh, it's rare when someone you've known a long time influences the course of history. But today's speaker did just that. I've known Werner Critchell and his wonderful family for nearly 50 years. They did and still do live in East Germany, behind the Iron Curtain at that time, where he served as superintendent of 24 Lutheran churches. In that position, he made sure that protest was still part of the Protestant tradition. His message of peaceful resistance was so powerful that the communist officials didn't quite know what to do with him. They assigned six secret police to follow him everywhere. It was. And they gave him the code name Buka Beach Tree. So how's it going? I hear some non-muted people. They gave him the code name Beach Tree. Why? Because he was solid and dependable and worthy of respect. And even the corrupt authoritarian politicians and their flunkies recognized that fact. After the wall fell, the Berlin Wall fell, Werner Kretschel helped ensure that the situation did not devolve into the tragic chaos that was happening at the same time in Romania, where the head of state was executed. Here in America, on the first anniversary of 9-11, Werner Kretschel spoke on reconciliation at Furman's opening convocation and the university conferred on him an honorary doctorate degree. Today, he will present the lecture he prepared 18 months ago, and I think you will find it as timely now as it was then. Ladies and gentlemen, speaking from Berlin, my good friend, Dr. Werner Kretschel. Thank you very much, Nancy and John, for the Welcome, and I'm very happy to be in connection with Green, well, uh, a kind of golden bridge between Greenville and Berlin. My lecture is on the subject Wars and Reconciliation, and begins with a famous word of President John F. Kennedy. In his unforgettable speech in West Berlin on June 26, 1963, the American president, John F. Kennedy, spoke the famous line, Ich bin ein Berliner, or in English, I am a Berliner. For the people in West Berlin, this was a life-saving statement. It meant that the Western world would not surrender this freedom island, but would defend it. This West Berlin was surrounded by East Germany, which was ruled by the communists, and it bordered, especially on East Berlin, the nom nominal capital of the so-called German Democratic Republic. This word democratic itself was a bold lie because the elections that were carried out regularly were altered completely every time. The East Jung people to whom my family and I belonged had to live with these lies because as happened in 1953, Soviet tanks threatened to destroy every resistance to the East German communists. This sentence spoke by John F. Kennedy in June 1963 was also significant in a higher 
political sense because two years earlier, the East German communists had built the Berlin Wall and had thus hermetically sealed the border between East and West Germany. Without risking one's life, none of us could get out of this sealed-in territory. It was mainly thanks to the United States that after the end of World War II in 1945, West Germany and West Berlin could become a free world for the Germans living there. Thus, the sentence spoken by Kennedy, I am a Berliner, had a significant political meaning. I am a Berliner. For me, this sentence also has a very personal meaning in the context of my family history. I belong to one of the few old Berlin families. My great-grandfather, Hermann Kretschel, was born in Berlin in 1815, more than 200 years ago, when Berlin was still a small town with only a few thousand inhabitants and a king. Like me, Hermann Kretschel became a leading minister of the Protestant Church. It was only 1920, a century ago, that Greater Berlin was formed by uniting many surrounding towns and villages. Rather like a miniature USA, United States of America. As opposed to West Germany, we in the East lived in a dictatorship. The tragic consequence of this was that Many East Germans, under pressure from the state, gave up their freedom values. I will illustrate this with two examples. First, at the time that communist East Germany was founded in 1949, about 90% of the population belonged to a church or other religious institution. When the Berlin Wall came down 40 years later, only about 20% belonged to a church, 90 and 20. This atheistic way of life, so omnipresent in Eastern Germany, continues to be a major influence even today. Secondly, in the free part of our country in West Germany, the military draft was introduced in 1956. The East German communists could not attempt to introduce this as an answer to West Germany because many young men would have then fled to the West, which at the time was fairly easy because no wall had yet closed border to West Germany. This was only possible after the wall was built and after the inner Germany border had been sealed from the east. Thus, the draft were introduced in East Germany only in 1962. I was one of the first to be drafted into this new ideologically atheistic army. I was 21 years old and studying theology in a medieval town with a famous cathedral. Night after night, we theology students discussed whether we should refuse, refuse the draft for reasons of conscience. Most of us, including me, wanted to refuse. Our parents were horrified. They remembered from Hitler period 
which had ended only 16 years earlier, that draft refusal would be punished with anything up to the death penalty. Thus, they advised us against refusal, but we did not follow their advice. And surprisingly enough, we were quite successful against the dictatorship. There were so many draft refusers in East Germany that the state could not afford to put so many young men into prison. After I had explained my reasons for refusal to the official military authority, I experienced, after this war of nerves, a humorous anecdote. The uniform the uniform concierge, surely a, surely a soldier during the war, stopped me on the way out of the building with these words. Why on earth did you refuse? You had the best results of health tests and could have been in the Air Force. Just imagine, you in an Air Force uniform. After hearing these two memories of mine, the giving up of church membership by so many people and the refusal to be drafted by so many young men, two chosen from countless other difficulties and hardships in a life in East Germany, you can understand what walls and barbed wire mean for human beings. They divide, they separate, they bring about terrible suffering. They deliver the individual victim to the person in power. But Sooner or later, the people who build the walls as apparent powers and victors become the losers. Beginning with the Chinese war, which was originally built to keep out the neighboring warriors, and which even today in China creates completely new visible and invisible walls inwardly and outwardly for the country. From guard cameras, the way to electronic and digi digital watchtower devices, including the Berlin Wall, which separated a people and countless families for 28 years, all the way today's walls existing or being built in Europe, for example, in Hungary or in, this, in these days in Poland against Belarus, Russia, or in other parts of the world, including the United States, building walls regardless of the material, is always a sign of fear. But fear is one of the worst and often most expensive aspects of our lives. The wall builders obviously never learn the lesson of history. Otherwise, they would recognize that the, osten that the ostensible victors always end up sooner or later as the losers. So, and now, dear friends, the second concept of our thematic discussions, walls and reconciliation. In my life, there have been many and sometimes completely unexpected 
reconciliation experiences. I'd like to tell you about one of these, especially because it happened in the United States, spe specifically in Syracuse, New York. I belong to the worldwide community of the Cross of Nails, oh, originating in the Cathedral of Coventry in the United Kingdom. The concept of reconciliation stands in the center of this intellectual and theological group, especially the reconciliation among states or ideologies they are opposed to each other. There are also a number of Cross of Nails members in the United States, especially in the Episcopal Church. Thus, I visited the cathedral in Syracuse some years ago. The dean took me to visit a church member. This man was dying and could only speak a few words with a mechanical assistance. Suddenly it turned out that this man had been one of the bomber pilots over Berlin in 1944. At that time, American and British bombers were continually attacking the big cities of Hitler's Germany. And I was a four-year-old boy below the bombers in Berlin. At night, many children was taken to the cellars of Hitler's office building for protection. One evening, I had to watch as another bus with children was hit by a bomb and exploded into flames. From that experience, I still have a deep childhood trauma. And now here I was, an adult and healthy, an adult and healthy former Berlin child at the bed of a dying bomber pilot. It was an overwhelming experience of reconciliation. And we all had tears in our eyes. Together we recited the reconciliation prayer of Coventry Cathedral in which again, Father, forgive. With a second reconciliation experience, I will close the discussion about this concept. In 1997, I took on the difficult assignment of introducing military chaplaincy into the formerly communist army ruled by atheism. This was in the end very successful. After the unification of both, both German states, all of the leaders of the army were German officers, West German officers. But these soldiers of the East German army who had obeyed orders and acted as they were expected to act, were all included into the army, which was now a unified German army. At the end of my service, I risked an unusual project. I invited the generals of West German, of the West German and of the former East German armies to a round table conversation. These were the men who, 
before and after the Berlin Wall fell, had had the military command. And it was thanks to these men that no blood was shed at that time. They had never met their counterparts before because the leading East German military people had all been discharged. There followed for highly charged nightly, they followed four highly charged nightly discussions. The Western generals could all speak English. The Eastern generals, Russian fluently. The leader of the East German delegation, Admiral Hoffmann, said something to me that also has something to do with reconciliation. Reverend Kretschau, I am surprised that my colleagues would follow a man of the church. But you should know that they have come only for your sake. They had heard the radio broadcasts after the fall of the Berlin Wall that you moderated in the Berlin City Hall, where you managed to bring together the old and the very new parties to govern Berlin. There were communists at the round table discussion there, but you treated them the same way you treated everyone else. That's the reason why we accepted your invitation today. During our last meeting, I asked the military leaders from East and West to write down answers to these three questions. First, what was my military responsibility before and after the fall of the Berlin Wall? Second, how do I see today, 15 years later, my behavior at the time? And third, according to your Western or Eastern lifestyle and experience, write a letter as a legacy to your grandchild. One general then said, you know, if a clergyman asks a soldier for something, it's like a command. Thus, a book resulted with letters written by the participants. And I dedicated online like one copy. Dear friends, when I prepared this lecture last year, there were then some interesting questions from Furman students. And I will try to answer. First question. What role did religion play for you and other religious persons before the building of the Berlin Wall? During that period and after and after the fall of the Berlin Wall? First, the role of religion in East Germany before the, build, before the building of the war. In East Germany, ruled over by communists from 1949 to 1989, the pressure on religion-oriented persons increased year by year. These persons were officially considered to be reactionary, and devoted to old-fashioned ideas. Church was seen as being influenced by the enemy in the West, especially the Americans. 
and was thus fought against. Their members were strongly disadvantaged, especially in all kinds of education areas. The path to higher professional responsibility was very difficult and was often connected to membership in the atheistically directed Communist Party. In addition, people were often pressured to leave the church officially. And we as church leaders have to watch as the majority of the people under pressure, unexpectedly enough, quickly gave up all their religious connections. After this, it was enough to have one generation of no longer religious persons to lose these connections completely. As a result, the church and its loyal members found themselves in an almost, almost non-Christian missionary situation in which, for example, the number of adult Christianings rose sharply. Second, the role of religion in East Germany during the 28 years of the Berlin Wall. The meaning of church and Christian beliefs can be described as a paradox. On the one hand, the church lost due to pressure from the state countless members so that only 20% of the population remained in a church. And in the huge so-called socialist newly, newly built satellite towns, only about 6% remained church oriented. oriented. Most people in East Germany did not want any disadvantages for themselves and especially not for their children. The loss of religious traditions was no longer important for them. But then the paradox, like the original Christians of the first centuries, this minority of Christians in East Germany accepted these disadvantages ordered by the state. And the quiet elite group gathered under the roofs of clerical buildings. In an atmosphere of freedom, the values of intellect culture and spirituality were celebrated. About two years before the opening of the Berlin Wall on November 9, 1989, our freedom-loving church-oriented world unexpectedly attracted more and more non-Christians. Although some ministers were afraid of state reprisals, many of us kept the doors of the churches open. And this is how the movement of tens of thousands began, who worked in the spirit of Christ, of nonviolence and of love for one's enemy all the way to the fall of the wall and the end of the Cold War. Of course, there had been a political decision on the world stage that had encouraged all of this. Mikhail Gorbachev, who had taken over the leadership of the Communist Party in the Soviet Union in 1985, had decided to change the doctrine, still valid at that time, that stated 
that any uprising in any country within the area of power of the Soviet Union were to be put down immediately by the use of Soviet tanks. With this change in doctrine, Gorbachev changed the course of world history. This history altering decisions reached East Germany through various channels and caused much unrest among the communist leaders of East Germany. However, the end of the tank doctrine encouraged resistance among large parts of the population. In a word, one could say that Gorbachev was the first to act in the spirit of Jesus and nonviolence. Some of the East German population reacted very posit positively when in October 1989 Gorbachev arrived in East Berlin to, to, in East Berlin to celebrate the 40th anniversary of communist East Germany. An interview that I gave to the journalist Robert Siegel on National Public Radio in the United States mentioned this visit in October 1989. Indeed, even during Gorbachev's visit in East Berlin, this the first demonstrations against the East German government began and they were put down brutally by the East German communists. But the Soviet tanks no longer went into action and thus holding on the power was no longer guaranteed for communists in East Germany and the other East European Soviet satellite countries. Thus, it was only a matter of time before the Berlin Wall came down one month later. The Cold War was at an end. And for East Germans, World War II finally came to an end after 44 years. For us in East Germany. The role of the religion in East Germany after the fall of the Berlin Wall. The effect of communism continues to fester in East Germany. Only a few people find their way to a consciously Christian life. It does help that many West Germans who grew, have grown up in a church environment have moved for professional or other reasons to East Germany. This is especially apparent in our Berlin congregations because after the federal government is united, Germ it is, it is, before, uh, after the federal government of United Germany and the parliament moved to Berlin, thousands of new workplaces have arisen. But that quite elite church group from East Germany is still important for unified Germany. Here I will mention just two names. First, German Chancellor Angela Merkel, who grew up in an East German personage. I have been close to her and her family since East German times. Last year, I conducted the funeral service of her mother. Second, Joachim Gauck, a minister, a colleague from East Germany, my age, who after the fall of the wall was the first head of the new authority charged with organizing and making available 
the files of the communist secret service. Later, he became the federal president of Germany. The next question, we in the West saw, saw only positive things resulting from reunification. Were there also negative ones? Yes, there were and still are negative results. Even today, East Germans feel like second-class Germans. I'll name only one of many reasons. More than 80% of the of leadership positions in politic in politics the economy science and culture are held by west germans thus with persons which never lived in east germany under communism Thus, a feeling of Western colonialism has arisen, especially because often East Germans, uh, East Germans are no less qualified for such leadership functions than their West German neighbors are. From this clear disadvantage, a mood has arisen in East Germany even 30 years after the fall of the wall and the national re reunification, which, for example, re presents itself during elections. For this reason, in recent election, many East Germans, many in East Germany, have voted for the extremely dangerous right-wing party called AfD, Alternative for Germany. Many of us are thus reminded of the dark Nazi periods of German history during the 20th century. In other words, next to all of the really positive experience, experiences after German reunification, such as freedom and prosperity. There are also negative experiences that need to be resolved 30 years after the reunification of both, both German states in 1990. The final question, where does the worldwide trend toward nationalistic and anti-democratic tendencies come from? Where does the worldwide trend toward nationalistic and anti-democratic tendencies come from? Let me remind you of the beginning of my lecture about the meaning of words, which are always expressions of fear. A similar reaction is the trend toward nationalistic and anti-democratic tendencies. Under the surface, we realize more or less consciously that our lifestyle of the past 50 years, especially in the Western world, has led to a threatening endangering of human life on our planet. Climate change is only one warning signal of this. Thus, the fear arises on the part of those who have a great deal that they will have to give up some of this to those who have little or nothing on our planet. 
This results in the tendency to close the gates or borders to all outsiders and to rise of strong men and perhaps also strong women who no longer need or want parliaments and will manipul man manipulate democratic decisions processes. The main thing for them, the wars. For me, there is another more religious explanation. When such egoistic tendencies become stronger and stronger, this is often because we try consciously to ignore the fact that we must understand this world as a creation of God, which has been entrusted to us and which we can only care for with respect for other people, especially for weaker people. And this basic respect for others that is necessary for the survival of mankind, we will find the necessary feeling of thankfulness for that which we have received or in terms of belief, gratitude toward God. Oh, how this inner sense of gratitude has disappeared from world and national politics and often from our own hearts. Only when thankfulness once again develops a definite power in our world, then the tendency toward nationalistic and anti-democratic leanings can slowly be reduced. Every one of us contribute toward this, whether this be through volunteers' activities for any kind of socially positive organization, or whether this be through voting against the people who propagate wars and divisions and hatred of all kinds. Difference. I thank you. All right, if anyone has any questions, please put them in the chat. And let me see. Vanna, can you hear me? Yes, I can. I just saw that Bob Buckman signed in from Memphis. You might want to say hello to him. Oh, I am very happy to. Oh, my best greetings to you, dear old friend. Turner, take care. Greetings from Memphis. Oh, wonderful to hear your voice, Bob. I was with Bob and our friend Larry Roush from Colorado just last week on a trout stream. So uh, this is a nice reunion. Uh, yes. Trout I'll ask a question uh, if someone else is waiting to, to put into chat. Let me ask one quick question. I've heard the term colonialism or neo-colonialism used for the relationship between East and West Germany that is still going on to today. Do you believe there is a kind of colonialism at, at play? Uh, yes, there are. These, uh, these, these problems are very vivid, but I think the new generation in Germany, the young people, about 20 years old, they are interested 
in the way of life of the East Germans who had to suffer under pressure. They are interested in the kind of living in the described way of culture and so on because you can observe by these experiences what is for your own life important or not important and you cannot um, expect these experiences, good experiences from the West, because in a dictatorship, you are dictatorship, you are uh, under pressure, and therefore these values are more developed than in a free board. And these next generations will ask a about our life in East Germany and the values that came, that, um, that are coming from the world under pressure when you are a person who wants to walk with an upright going. And this is in a dictatorship, the minority, but in this way and in this surrounding you find these wonderful values that we lived and um, the, the 30 years from the unification until today was more influenced by west german colonialism that i described the leading positions all in the hands of the of western persons although some East Germans were uh, much better in their profession. But they said, you are weak East Germans, you are not developed, you are not free. And there is a kind of, as I said, night. Envy. Envy. Yeah. I think there is a kind of envy in West Germans, not at all, but some of the leading West Germans are a little bit envious because the, this, the page in the book of history, there is standing, the East Germans made the first unbloody revolution in Germany and they said why not the West Germans stand in the book of history the poor East Germans and from that is coming a kind of envy and this leads uh, to this behavior of going in this world because we are better very good. Thank you. May I go ahead and read a couple of questions from the chat room? And then any extra ones we will answer in the future, in the next couple of days, if that's okay. First question from Mary Stone. What do you, Verna, see as ways to reunite the USA? We uh, are a fragmented people. Yeah. Oh, what a question. But, you know, we are very close with our hearts to the destiny of your nation. Between, because of the separation, especially under the Trump uh, area. Uh, he was interested in separation in different ways. And uh, the, I think a unification, the inner unification of the United States will, um, will be successful when you 
don't react in the spirit of revenge, but in the spirit of love. I remember in in my life with a fight of com in the fight against communists. The most effective weapon was love. You can see the faces of communists when you are when you give in the language of your body, in your words, in your behavior, that you love the counterpart. He is totally, uh, totally disturbed. He cannot uh, answer. And that is the only way to change his heart and to make him convince that this is the only way, a way to bring a nation together, to bring a couple together again, to bring enemies on the same table as I described in my lecture. Thank you. We have a question from Professor uh, Cleve Fraser, who I think met you in Berlin. He says, you have mentioned that individuals need to overcome the walls that are in their minds. How can this best be accomplished? The walls in the minds. <clears throat> um, only in the way that you tell stories from both sides from the side of the free world and from our world under dictatorship. And that is very often an experience in our communication between Easterners and Westerners that if we tell our life stories or our experience in our normal life, then disappeared, then will disappear all hatred, all, um, all feeling to be better or not to be better. And this is the best way, but the difficulty is that many West Germans are not interested to hear the stories of the East Germans. And therefore, in the future, it is necessary to find any way and any communication centers and possibilities that Eastern and Western persons can come to, the, to tell their stories. And another main point is teach these differences in the schools from the first classes on that every child in Germany knows I have a background of the free world as a West German and my, my parents and grandparents, they are from the East and they live under very different conditions and there is no uh, being better or worse. And this is a, a task for the future for every political and educational way of uh, in Germany. Thank you. Well, let's do one last question. There are a number of other comments, including a number of thank you notes from people for your presentation. Uh, delayed though it was, it is very uh, timely today. Uh, have one last question uh, and then the others we will put somehow we'll put out there and we can uh, answer them in the coming days this one's from bob fannin he says reunification this is a, a difficult one so take your time reunification cost west germany over a trillion dollars and many problems in changing cultural perspectives could reunification have been done differently? 
Kannst du mir das übersetzen? Uh, uh, repeat the question. Vielleicht auf, auf meinem armen Deutsch. Um, Reunifikation hat gekostet mehr yeah. als Trillionen Dollar uh, von Westdeutschland uh, und hat auch um, uh, und viele Probleme sind auch entwickelt uh, beim Jane Helmchen, help me, beim uh, Änderen den der kulturellen Perspektiven. Okay? Ja. <lacht> könnte Reunifikation. Um, um, Wiedervereinigung hat uh, Westdeutschland mehr als eine Billion Dollar gekostet. Könnt, uh, und außerdem hat es viele Probleme uh, verursacht um, mit der Kulturperspektive. Hätte man das anders machen können. Viel besser. Danke. Ja, oh ja nun gut. <laughs> Jane, many thanks for you. Great that we hear us by this way. Uh, I want to answer. It is very difficult to say something uh, in question of the, unif of the inner unification when you say three or four or six millions figures the detail and figures are, are very bad for a good discussion because you could answer the east germans had to pay to the russians many many millions and trillions of east german uh, economy power And if you begin uh, to make figures, you could, uh, you, you could find a very difficult balance between, between East and West. It was not only the West who helped the East. I think the key of a good solution of this Uh, East and West problem, East Germany and West uh, Germany, is to accept that the history of the West is a very different from the East. And on both sides, you find wonderful experiences and wonderful uh, values of freedom in the West and of culture in the east and if you bring in these experiences in good words and understand understandable words both sides could uh, support each other by their own experiences that is the way of an inner unification not to show the differences but yes to show the differences but not in the result to uh, to to make the, the, each other envious but to help each other and to to uh, to see and to uh, to, uh, to, uh, to uh, yes to see and to accept the merits of the other side with a very different history. Thank you, Werner. I think I speak on behalf of everyone who has watched and listened uh, in saying that we are very grateful for the time you have taken both to write this, uh, this uh, lecture uh, and for all of the difficulties that you had in trying to come here Uh, having to uh, make your changes multi-times. We are very grateful to you that you've brought us this message finally. And this is not the end of it. That is to say, uh, other people are going to be listening to this uh, on tape and they will have their responses as well. We'll figure out a way for them to get back to us and then for the message and questions to get to you. But in the meantime, 
Thank you very much for your time, your talent, your wisdom, and your leadership, both spiritual and uh, earthly leadership. We appreciate that. Yes, I thank you too, especially um, Nancy and Don and Bob Buckman and Jane Friedman close here in Berlin and all friends who have listened and God bless you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And, and thank you for joining us and, and everyone. We give us a few days to um, get the recording up on our YouTube channel and the answers to the questions. And we'll post links to all of that in our newsletter this Friday. If you're not an Ali member, you can get in touch with Don or me and we'll let you know how to um, access those. Yeah. Thank you very much for attending. Thank you to our speaker. Thank you to Don for um, coordinating this. This has been a wonderful, very interesting hour. Yes, thank you, thank you very much. My best to all your family. Bye-bye. Yes, bye-bye. Wie mache ich das jetzt aus? Wie mache ich das jetzt aus? Recording. Where? Stop it, Alan.